an experienced software engineer is now 10x more capable than they were two years ago, right? right. And therefore, a, a novice uh, software developer is not that useful to you today's world because they can't guide the AI as efficiently as an experienced software developer. So that's one starting point. That's where we're seeing your early um, uh, efficiencies in the tech companies. But that's very quick, quickly going to spread to broader companies. Just as a simple example, if you're, say, uh, Air Canada and you're an airline, right? Just you have teams of accountants that are just trying to do month end financial closings and quarterly closings and uh, just trying to navigate general ledger reconciliation. All of that's going to be automated completely with AI over the next couple of years. Uh, in fact, the function of auditing will essentially be automated because it's just checking and ratifying right. that the balances line up. And that can be done by AI extremely effectively. The human being is just needed for exception handling. So I think over time, the next, say, three to five years, we'll see those efficiencies move from just the tech sector, uh, broad scale into most organizations. And my prediction is in the next three to five years, you'll be able to run an organization for about a quarter of what you could today. Uh, and then over a period of five to seven years, it's 10x cheaper than what you could today. What does this mean for the workforce? Is this something you've, you've thought about? I don't know. Like, not every tech person who's really into AI has really thought about this. They're just like, I just want to build AGI and I just want to, you know, create the greatest AI ever. Um, but then you have the people going, well, what about everyone else if we replace all the jobs? Yeah. Uh, and there's a lot of debate on what's actually going to happen here. Generally, tech has not taken jobs. It generally creates more jobs. Curious how you think this plays out with AI, because obviously it's a little bit different than anything else we've seen before. I, le I lean towards that angle a lot more. So uh, Balaji Srinivasan from Coinbase uh, has an interesting take on it. And he says, AI doesn't start a task or end a task, but it's really good middle to middle, right? And so let's say you've got right. a customer service person. Um, you'll have an AI handling easy customer service calls, but the minute a difficult customer or tricky situation shows up, you want to have passed to a human being as quickly as possible. Right? Now, what happens over time is that you have customer service, they're just doing a ton more of it because an AI can handle all the 80% easy stuff. Uh, and then the level two, level three support needs can be handled by a human being. And they can do a lot more because they're not doing the grunt work of all the 80% stupid calls of, hey, I wanted to refund and it got lost. Can you check the order number status, right? All of that stuff can now be handled by AI and the human beings can do this. We have a really good, I don't know if you guys on your podcast have ever talked about the bank teller from the 1970s phenomenon. So no, in the 70s, we created ATM machines. There was a whole bunch of hand wringing. What will we do with millions of bank tellers? They'll be wandering the streets aimlessly, <laughs> no etc., etc. And all sorts of hand wringing about that. Um, because what will we do? Literally, because you can run a bank without very many tellers. What actually happened was the cost of running a bank branch dropped by about ten times, and the banks created ten times more branches, and the number hmm. of bank tellers has not changed at all. Right? And we see this consistently. The other factoid I have is the countries with the highest robotics penetration in the world are Sweden, South Korea, Germany, and the countries with the lowest unemployment in the world are Sweden, South Korea, Germany, because there's just so much more work to do on increased efficiency, design thinking, problem solving, that human beings are going to take a long time. And as you very appropriately put, we invent a ton more job functions that didn't exist before. Right. And so web designer today, the big thing is prompt engineer and all sorts of stuff will kind of emerge as people are caretaking the AIs to do stuff. We saw this in the agricultural revolution where you had human beings doing stuff, then we created machines that were 100 times more effective, and now you had human beings servicing the machines that did 100 times more work. And so I think that's the kind of outcome we'll see around all of this. Now, it's possible that you end up in a really an abundance world, and we talk a lot about what does this look like. For example, in a few years, we'll have energy abundance. Right, and that has profound consequences for the human species. Uh, and so, what do we do at that point? And I think that's just part of a continuum over history. Where, if you went back ten thousand years ago, we're all working twenty hours a day in the fields just to put three meals on the table. Right? We've shrunk steadily the amount of time needed to earn a livable wage, and that'll keep shrinking to near zero over time. Interesting. Yeah, I, I think I'm in that camp as well, where I think it's going to end up creating more jobs, at least for a certain period of time, maybe down the road as things get to, which we're going to talk about in a little bit, AGI or ASI or whatever we're calling it these days. Maybe things can change, but I just think that 
probably we're going to create more jobs first before we start yeah. losing jobs from it. Very my, much, very much so is my view. You mentioned that we're going to have an abundance of energy, and you said I think you said in a few years, maybe. Yeah. Talk to me about that. What what do you, what do you mean here? I know energy is very connected to AI for those listeners. Like we talk about energy a lot because it's needed to to power these massive data centers and compute. And you know we're building some of the biggest centers in the world because of AI. And so energy is is very relevant. Um, but why do you, why do you say that we're going to have unlimited? Well, uh, we track well, the things we do uh, for years have been tracking exponential curves, right? So Moore's law is the most famous doubling pattern every 18 months now for 60 years uninterrupted. That's kind of incredible. Ray Kurzweil made this observation that once you start an exponential curve and the price performance of some product or technology or service starts doubling on a regular periodic basis, that doubling never stops. Okay. Now, this is very hard to get your head around because you can't have infinite growth. It's got to level off at some point. And if you look at computation, the reason it's gone on for so long is that we've moved from vacuum tubes where you're doing doubling it in a certain way, then to uh, relays, then transistors, now integrated circuits. And each of them in a little S-curve where technology takes off, accelerates, reaches its upper limits, but an information-based paradigm has you invent the next technology that takes it over. Like we, we're reaching the end of... Uh, integrated circuits, and now we have the NVIDIA-style matrix chips, and soon we'll have photonics, and then quantum computing, you know, which requires a lot of alcohol to get into. Uh, and so you end up keep hopping from technology to technology. We're now seeing a dozen technologies operating on this basis, including energy. So solar energy, for example, is doubling every 22 months in its price performance, and it's been doing that for 40 years, okay? This is not new. So uh, at this pace, we will be able to deliver the entire world's energy supply with solar in eight years. We're like four doublings away from that. Okay, not that we will, but we'll be able to. Okay, now the last oil price crash in 2013 or whatever happened because of a two percent oversupply in the market. It's a really tightly wound market, so it doesn't take a lot for unwind it. My thesis on why Russia is invading Ukraine right now is they have to. In a few years, the oil and gas won't be worth anything, so they have to mm. do it now. Of course, you have a war, it pops up the price of oil, right? And so uh, as we get to, and right now we've got a surge of demand because data centers are, are energy hungry as, as, as all heck as is crypto mining, etc. And therefore we've got this burst of energy demand that's gonna need us to build out and sa um, solve that energy gap with whatever means necessary. But over time, uh, as solar kind of really, really takes over. Now the big challenge is you can generate a ton of energy. Where do you store it? So th then the problem shifts to battery technology. Uh, we're already seeing batteries in labs that are about a thousand times more effective than the current law uh, models. So over time that gets solved as well. And then you'd have an abundance of energy, right? Now an abundance of energy has profound implications uh, for lots and lots of things. So uh, as you take the energy costs away, a huge host of things becomes easier, food supply, food security, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And therefore uh, the, uh, this is a kind of, this is why we kind of talk about singularities as it's happening as like the little s. There's all these inflection points that we've never seen before in the history of humanity. Energy has been scarce for the entire history of humanity, right? And it's going to soon become abundant, right? If, for example, in Chile, in, in South America, they're already generating so much solar, they're giving it to their neighboring countries for free. And it's <laughs> happening right now. So this is no joke. We've hit, we're hitting negative um, oil uh, energy prices in Europe during the summers, et cetera, et cetera. And so this is just going to keep propagating, and we're going to see more and more weirdness around this. This has huge implications. Like for example, Canada, right? Forty percent of our exports are oil. Okay, so that's a big hit to the economy in just a few years, and that's a very big deal to be talking about. And it's not in the public discourse enough. Hmm. Very interesting. You mentioned the word singularity. You also. I think founded a company called Singular University. What's the name of it? Yeah, I'm the founding CEO of Singularity University, which is okay. based at was based at NASA in Silicon Valley. Uh, the main founders are Peter Diamandis and Ray Kurzweil, uh, and so I've ran all the programs for like seven years. So my secret superpower is if there's a lecture lab workshop on blockchain, I've heard it sixty times, autonomous cars sixty times. Uh, AI 60 times. So as my wife says, I can pretend to speak about anything now. Um, <laughs> uh, and we looked at what are the technologies that have these doubling patterns and where are they intersecting? Because 
biotech, neuroscience, robotics, AI, 3D printing, solar energy. You have a dozen technologies now operating on that doubling pattern. And where they intersect, that's a whole other multiplier, right? And so mm. there's some pretty huge things happening, huge categories of products and services getting launched at the intersection of some of these capabilities. And this is what you term as the singularity. I've also heard it called like the economic singularity or how do you define The economic that? singularity, which is a whole other thing. But uh, Ray Kurzweil popularized this term called the technological singularity, which is when does human inte machine intelligence overtake human intelligence? And, and at that point, you enter a totally different form of evolution that's uh, information based and technology based rather than evolution, which is slow and messy and takes, you know, millions of years. Um, I, I kind of kind of disagree with the concept a little bit because what do you mean by overtaking the minute I can prescriptively describe a task and he is going to do it anyway. And uh, my other beef is that we really don't know what intelligence is to talk about defining it very clearly. Uh, for example, there's about a dozen facets of intelligence. Okay, The IQ test measures two of them, the speed of thought processing and the ability to match concepts across frameworks. So that's what the IQ test does. But it does measure emotional intelligence or spatial intelligence, like athletic ability, uh, linguistic or musical intelligence, the Eastern concept of presence or awareness or spiritual intelligence. Um, if you're a business leader, you're using emotional intelligence a great deal of the time to make judgment calls, right? So yep. what was that? So this is where I disagree with what do we mean by intelligence that we're talking about? And this is my same rant about AGI. We talk about artificial and general intelligence, but we have no idea what we're talking about when we mean intelligence in the first place. Now they're coining <laughs> the term ASI, artificial super intelligence. Well, that makes no sense to me either. Um, and and uh, some people say it's when a, an AI can do better than human at economic tasks, but that's the case already. Right, a, a autonomous driver is do, a car is doing a much better job of driving than I can. Doesn't get six, doesn't take coffee breaks, doesn't unionize any of that stuff. Right. So, what do we mean by any of that? Uh, at last count that I saw, there are fourteen different different definitions of AGI. Okay, like so, so can we? So we're, we're incredible to me. We're raising billions of dollars for a concept that we can't define, measure, or test. Want to stay ahead of the biggest technological shift in history? Subscribe now to get insights straight from the sharpest minds in tech and finance. Quick legal note, this show is for educational purposes only. Nothing here is financial advice. Investing always carries risk. Never invest more than you can afford to lose. Thanks for tuning in. See you in the next one.